is an internationally renowned speaker and commentator, and he just so happens to be the chairman of the board of the National Action Network and the senior pastor of Grace Baptist Church in the city of Mount Vernon. Let us receive with a hearty, hearty applause the chairman of the board of the National Action Network, the one and only Reverend Dr. W. Franklin Richardson. Let us receive him now. Good morning. Come on, let's all stand up and celebrate the opening of the convention. Come on, let's do some, let's do some applause. We got back here, 2018. We've been through a lot. We've been through great trials, but we're determined to succeed. Amen. Let me tell you that we are proud of the National Action Network and our president, Reverend Al Sharpton, and all the members of the board. That's right, let's celebrate our president. And all the members of our board who work hard to maintain our organization. It has been a marvelous journey of evolving into who we are today. Today, we are the most effective and impactful civil rights organization in the United States of America. I was sharing with Reverend Sharpton just yesterday, if we had moved out the National Action Network, if the National Action Network did not exist, African-American people would not have a platform by which we could articulate our concerns in this hour. If you move the National Action Network out, you would not have a place where the leaders and the political leaders of our communities would be able to come and share and understand where we are. The National Action Connect uh, Network is vital to the essential leadership and progress of black people in America. It is vital. I was sharing with Congressman Rangel that we really wish that this convention could be held in various sections of the country. Because all over America, what we are doing here needs to be done. Because we have to sensitize the masses to the critical times in which we are voting. I hope that these days that you spend with us will be days that will inform, inspire, and encourage you to be engaged, not just to uh, uh, an observer, but a t participant in the struggle. That you will go back to your communities, go back to your churches, go back to your neighborhoods, and energize our people for the fight that is ahead with us in 2018. In November 2018, we have an opportunity to change the direction of this country. We have the greatest opportunity, and we must not miss it. We must involve ourselves in every aspect of it. And so today, I welcome you to this convention and welcome you to what we're doing in the National Action Network. We're growing. You know, we're over 86 chapters now across the country. We're <coughs> How many? 106. Uh, Brother, two works too hard for me to say 86. It's, it's, it's 106 chapters across America. Isn't that powerful? 106 chapters. We have six regional offices across America. We are indeed a national organization, and we are pushing forward to have a, to make a difference and to push the next generation. We're not just occupiers of this moment, but the future is what this must be about. I'm happy to welcome our, some of our guests today who are sharing with us a young man who's been in the struggle a long time from the perspective of political leadership, and I'm happy to have him come and share with us Ruben Diaz, Jr. from the Bronx, our speaker. God bless you, Ruben. We're happy to have you here. Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. That's right. I am Ruben Diaz, Jr., the Bronx Borough President. I know the Bronx is in the house, right? Uh, don't confuse me for Kirsten Foy. He didn't switch up his clothing so quickly. I, I just want to congratulate and thank uh, uh, the great chairman, uh, Dr. Franklin Richardson, as well as your president and founder, uh, Reverend Sharpton. Let's give Reverend Sharpton a strong round of applause. 
Uh, very quickly, family, I just want to come by and on behalf of not only Bronx Heights, but all New Yorkers and everyone all over the country, I want to say thank you. Thank you to Nan. Thank you for all of your years in the pursuit of justice. We know that that pursuit and the way that you've done it throughout the years has come in many different ways and for many different reasons. You've been look, pursuing justice uh, when it comes to fighting against police brutality and comforting families who are the family of the victims around police brutality, uh, for bettering the public education system. You've been pursuing justice to ensure that we have better living conditions in the New York City Housing Authority. You've been pursuing justice when we are calling for criminal justice reform. You've been pursuing justice, fighting so that our immigrants know that we love them and that we're progressing as a city and as a nation, despite what number 45 is saying out in Washington, D.C. And yes, that part of justice has also been evident when you are out there fighting when you had the Navy get out of Puerto Rico and Reverend Sharpton did some time behind bars over it. And lastly, let me just say this. I want to commend you, as your chairman said, for cultivating, nurturing, and encouraging new leadership. You have really embodied that phrase with our vision, the people shall perish. You see that with Tamika Mallory. You see that with Kirsten Foy. And you saw that in a young assembly member when you were out there fighting for justice for Amadou Diallo, when you helped a young assembly member find his voice. And today, we are working to better the Bronx and New York City and to ensure that all of the pillars of opportunity and hope that Dr. King fought for are going to come into reality here in the city of New York. God bless you and enjoy the convention. We're fortunate to have sharing with us also today a gentleman who has conducted himself in a way that has fostered justice and consciousness in this uh, city. And I want to welcome our Attorney General, Eric Schneiderman, as he comes to give us news. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. It is always an honor to join you. Uh, Reverend Sharpton, thank you for convening us. Uh, Chairman Richardson, Kirsten Foy, other uh, warriors in the struggle. This year's National Action Network Convention, I think, is more important than ever because we are in a moment of tremendous turmoil and we are in a moment of tremendous change because great progress, history teaches us, only comes out of moments of great turmoil. And there are many new people waking up ready to join, ready to get active, and it is up to all of you who have been laying the groundwork for this moment for so many years to rise to the occasion and lead. This year's convention is a convention on the cusp of great change. My friends, it is clear from the violently regressive policies that explode out of Washington like debris from some toxic volcano of bad ideas that we must rise to this occasion and recommit ourselves to the active, aggressive, and fearless pursuit of justice that characterized the life of Martin Luther King, whose memory we celebrate this year. It is very appropriate, thank you. It is very appropriate that we are now looking back 50 years to remember another moment of great turmoil from which great progress flowed, but it only works if we rise to the occasion as other generations have risen. So I, I am your lawyer, uh, if you are a New Yorker, Governor Murphy, uh, uh, I'm your lawyer as long as you're in my jurisdiction. <laughs> and it's always good to listen to your lawyer. And I will tell you this, I have never seen this level of intense activism, of the desire, the hunger, of millions of Americans to rejoin the fight to make our country what it's supposed to be, a true democracy with a system of justice that is truly just and a commitment to equality that knows no barriers. We are up against, the battle lines have never been more clearly drawn. We are up against open racists, open xenophobes, open bigots, open homophobes, open misogynists. 
It's not a close call. It's not subtle. And we cannot be subtle either. So I am proud of the work we've done in my office, leading the legal resistance to the bad policies spewing out of that toxic volcano. The New York Times did a piece in December commemorating our 100th legal action against the Trump administration. Right? We, we have fought them and we beat them on their anti-Muslim travel bans. We beat them on their efforts to, to hurt the dreamers and shut down the DACA program, which we, is open to this day because of an injunction we got in federal court in Brooklyn. We fought them on their efforts to dial back critical environmental regulations, and we have fought them on their efforts to undermine democracy. We challenged his phony voter fraud commission and shut it down. And we are now fighting them to stop them from putting a question demanding to know citizenship status on the census. And Eric Holder, who's speaking later, is gonna to talk to you about that too. He's, in, he's right in this fight with us. Imagine this, my friends. A federal official going door to door, demanding to know citizen status in an immigrant community. That's gonna drive millions of people into the shadows. And for states like New Jersey and New York with large immigrant communities, it will cost us billions of dollars in federal funding, hurt our representation in the House of Representatives and the Electoral College. We will not let this stand. So we will fight, we will slow them down, we will stop them with our legal work. But it's up to all of you because at the end of the day, we have to beat them at the polls. And we are coming up on the most important midterm elections in our lifetime. I will be there with you every step of the way. My lawyers will be there fighting with you every step of the way. But again, new people coming in, people who've never called an official, never lobbied, never voted in some cases, they need your leadership. There are activists in this room who've been waiting for this moment for years. Let us rise to the occasion. Others have been called, other generations, now we are called. Are we ready to rise? Then I will rise with you. Thank you. We're blessed by this great affirmation of leadership joining us as we launch this convention. I want to welcome uh, our New York State Controller, Mr. Snyderman, who's going to share with us. Come right on. I made, you, I made you the state, but it's the New York City Controller. Thank you very much. We all know who he is. <laughs> well, my, my name is Scott Stringer, and I got the money in the bank for New York City. And I get those pension checks out on time. Because if I don't, Schneiderman's going to come sue me, so I get it. Let me say to uh, Reverend Richardson and, of course, Reverend Sharpton, every year that this convention convenes, it is not simply about speeches, right? What I like about this convention, as Reverend Sharper likes to point out, we don't have any time to waste. We've got to make policy, and that's why we're here today. And we have to make sure, we have to make sure that the policy we're making is for the people who are struggling, not just in New York City, but also struggling in this country. And I want to say I'm going to be back here during the week because we're going to have a serious conversation about wealth creation in cities across America. For too long, the money has been taken by one group of people, making sure that that locks out other people. You know what I'm saying. And it's time that we level the playing field. And Reverend Sharpton has said, it's time to do that now. We cannot determine our children's future based on the zip code they live in. And we, and we cannot allow our city to be gentrified and push out the people from Bed-Stuy, from Brownsville, from the West Side, from all the places in Queens and the Bronx where people laid a marker down in neighborhoods that no one wanted to live in, and suddenly the people built up our neighborhoods, the people in this room are being pushed out. That is not gonna happen anymore in our city. So I'll be back at you. Enjoy the convention. There's amazing speakers, amazing opportunity to change the course of this country. And let me say one last thing. Many of you know me not as controller, but I'm an usher at NAN on Saturdays. I'm, I, I brought, come on, you know it. 
think about it. I'm the only guy who could say in the morning when my six-year-old says, Daddy, you going to Nan this morning, okay? So I'll see you this week. Thank you very much. My brothers and sisters, there has been one consistent voice and presence that has galloped this organization for more than 25 years. A voice that has been never relenting, a voice that has been heard around the world, a man who's been beaten and criticized but never lost his way, never got clouded by his enemies, never got dis dissuaded by those who were against justice, a man who took nothing and made what we have today, the National Action Network, up and down on planes, in and out of cities, in the mid late night and the early mornings, carrying the burden of finance and operation and administration of this important denomination. I'm telling you now, it's my joy to welcome the leader, our leader, the leader of the National Action Network, the leader, organizer, and founder, our president, Reverend Al Sharpton. Let's celebrate this guy. Thank you. 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 Thank you very much, and I want. Mayor de Blasio to know that was for me, not you coming in. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. <laughs> Let me say first to the chairman of our board, Dr. W. Franklin Richardson, And to all our board members, our staff, our executive vice president, general counsel, attorney Michael Hardy, our chapter leaders from around the country, you that have come in, there is not a more important convention we've had than now. We are in a crisis in this country where this president, aside from his policies that, in our judgment, jeopardizes civil rights law. He has lowered the dignity of the office of the presidency. <laughs> 50 years ago, April 4th, Martin Luther King Jr. was killed in Memphis. 50 years ago in June, Robert Kennedy was killed in a hotel kitchen in Los Angeles. Dr. King's son and daughter is with us this week because of what we are seeing in this administration is a threat to all that they achieved. The Voting Rights Act that Dr. King fought for is being undermined with voting gerrymandering and voting suppression screen, uh, schemes that are being masqueraded over with voter fraud commissions that can't find any fraud because there is none to find. The Civil Rights Act is being undermined when you have a president that does not see any kind of civil rights violation, but can tweet about anything on television. The family from Sacramento, California is here, whose young un unarmed young man, Stefan Clark, was killed. His sister's grandmother, who was in the house five feet away, are joining us this morning. You notice, even with Starbucks, I didn't see Trump tweeting about that. 
so in this year that we mark a half century since King, it is up to us to keep the dream alive and preserve what was won in civil rights and voting rights. There is another seminal figure that we have in American history. I would argue that the two seminal figures that no one could ignore in history that are from our community have been Dr. King and President Barack Obama. And the Affordable Care Act of President Obama, his initiatives in commuting sentences of nonviolent drug offenders, as well as his dealing with policing and other issues, are being challenged and being in many ways withdrawn by this administration. So this organization is unequivocally and unapologetically going to fight this administration on the King legacy and the Obama administration moves. We are proud to hold that banner. Now, before I bring on a host of speakers, and Eric Holder is here, who is our main one this morning. And we're going to cut the ribbon open up. We're going to hear from the mayor of New York and the governor of New Jersey. The governor of New York is uh, en route. Uh, I see our senior civil rights stateswoman, Hazel Dukes, from the NACP. Y'all give her a hand. And we call them the griot. When you go beyond icon, the griot, no one has worked longer, stronger, and harder than our forever congressman, Charlie Rangel's in the house. But I had one speaker that could not make it that wanted to say hello to us this morning. Look to the screen. Hey, everybody. I wish I could be there with all of you again at the National Action Network. And I am grateful to Reverend Sharpton and all of you for letting me say a few words. We've been properly remembering Dr. King this month, this preacher with no official rank or title who somehow gave voice to our deepest dreams and our most lasting ideals, this leader who stirred our national conscience and helped make our union more perfect, this American who reminded us that people who love their country can change it. The steady flame of courage he left behind would sustain generations of marchers through the campaigns to come, through boycotts and voter registration drives, through movements for economic and social justice. His example inspired generations of Americans to never be trapped by what is, but to always push for what ought to be. That's what you all are doing at the National Action Network, fighting to ensure equal access to jobs, to justice, to education, and to the ballot, especially when it's hard, especially when confronted with resistance or hostility or the inertia of a stubborn status quo. So thank you for taking up this generational campaign to keep Dr. King's flame alive, a campaign of citizens who believe that America is a constant work in progress and that together we can always change it for the better. Thanks, everybody. May God bless all of you. Bye -bye. Former President Barack Obama. Let us hear first greetings. We have a tech center in his state that is hosted last night our out of town delegates. It's 2,800 feet, square feet. And we have uh, 17 chapters. And he has been one that has been committed to working with NAN all over the country, but particularly in this state. Let us welcome the governor of New Jersey, Governor Phil Murphy. Good morning, all. You, I promise you, you look up on the dictionary and beside the, the phrase short straw, you're gonna see 
the person who has to follow Reverend Al Sharpton speaking. <laughs> I want to thank Reverend Sharpton, Dr. Richardson, uh, for their partnership and for their leadership. I want to thank the New Jersey leader day in and day out of Nan, Reverend Steffi Bartley, who's down the front row here today. God bless you, Reverend. It is, is that the mayor of Newark right beside you? That's Mayor Roz Baraka right there. Come on, man. One of America's great mayors. We got another one up here, Mayor Bill de Blasio of New York City is with us. I was looking up at President Obama, and I'm sure uh, a former Attorney General Eric Holder would agree with me as we both served under the president. Those were the good old days. And boy, would we like to get them back. D DNC Chair Tom Perez is right here helping us get in that fight to get it back. Reverend Sharpton, again, I can't thank you enough. I'll be very brief. And by the way, you pointed out my, one of my North Stars. I stand here as the governor of New Jersey, but I'm also a proud former member of the National Board of the NAACP, and I wouldn't have been there without Hazel Dukes. Let there be no doubt. Nan is a partner in, uh, in, in everything that we do in so many respects in New Jersey. And if you follow me around at all, you'll hear me talk every moment about we need to get a stronger and fairer New Jersey that works for every family, not just for some. And we have the two-dimensional chess reality. We're not only pushing back on all the stuff that's coming at us out of the Trump administration, but we're digging out of eight years of a legacy in our state where we didn't grow, we weren't strong, we weren't fair, and when it did work, it worked for too few of us. So Nan is a partner day in and day out with us on both the, the stronger and the fairer New Jersey. You probably hear more about the fairer side because we're, we're pounding away. We're going to get minimum wage raised to $15 an hour. Uh, equal pay for equal work for women uh, in our state. Uh, child dependent care tax credit, comprehensive criminal justice reform, funding public education at long last, signing common sense gun safety laws, and partnering with other like-minded states like New York. Nan is a partner in all of those. But Nan is also a partner in the stronger New Jersey, in the growing New Jersey. And we won't grow again unless we have an urban agenda which is robust and unless we re-seize the innovation economy. And Raz Baraka knows this better than anybody. Nan Tech World in Newark embodies both of those principles. It's at the center of our urban agenda, and it's at the center of our innovation agenda. So whether it's the stronger New Jersey, the fairer New Jersey, the New Jersey that has to work for everybody, not just some, I'm honored to stand with Reverend Sharpton, uh, Reverend Bartley, and all of the great members of NAN, day in and day out. God bless you all, and thank you for everything you do. Let us hear now from the mayor of the city of New York, a longtime friend and partner with National Action Network, Mayor Bill de Blasio. This is a, a wonderful time for everyone here to be gathering because this is a powerful moment in our history. And I have to tell you a constant, no matter whether times are good or bad, or the struggles are easier or harder, a constant has been the National Action Network. You should be very proud of that fact. One of the things I deeply appreciate about Reverend Sharpton and Dr. Richardson and all of the leadership of this organization is the idea that people need to be organized everywhere all the time. That's what NAN has done everywhere all the time. I remember when this was a brand new organization, Reverend, and it has grown, I think, beyond everyone's wildest expectations. And I want to thank Reverend Sharpton for continuing to be a voice of conscience, for continuing to remind us, and this is all about his roots in Dr. King's movement, to remind us that if we reach people, if we organize people, if we show them what's possible, the world can change. He has never lost that faith, and Reverend, thank you for that. 
This is an extraordinary group of leaders here who are making a difference in this city, in this state, in our neighboring state, and all over the country. And I especially appreciate our former Attorney General, because he is trying to bring fairness to our election process. And I have to say one other acknowledgement, because I I'll tell you, it, it is a challenge to be a mayor during the Trump administration. And I want to give some credit where credit is due to my brother from Newark, Ross Baraka, who is doing an outstanding job. Outstanding. So look, I'm going to be very quick, but I want to make a, a fundamental point here. It is a powerful moment in history, not because of the negatives. We know all about the negatives. We know all about the reasons to be upset, to be discouraged. We are seeing things every day on the news we never thought possible, right? We've seen norms that we used to cherish torn up tweet after tweet. The notion of dignity is way back in the rear view mirror. But that should not confuse us, the fact that the occupant in the White House or the result of a particular election because of the perverse nature of the Electoral College, those things should not confuse us or dissuade us from action. I'm going to argue very quickly that we actually should see this moment as a time of tremendous possibility. And we are the ones lucky enough to live in this time. You know, the night before we mourned the loss of Dr. King and we celebrated his life 50 years after his assassination and we remembered what he meant to us, that night before here in New York City, we wanted to do something powerful and meaningful to appreciate that moment. Reverend Sharpton joined us and we were in Washington Square in Greenwich Village, we have a beautiful arch there. We lit up the arch with an image of Dr. King. And we replayed the last speech of his life that night before he was assassinated. And remember, as we know, he was in Memphis to organize working people for change, to stand up for people who were being treated unfairly. And he was connecting all the dots in one of the most powerful and profound ways. He was fighting against income inequality and poverty while he was fighting against an unjust war, while he was fighting for civil rights. He understood they all went together. And at night he gave a speech, and most of us have heard a few lines from that speech, where it was almost prophetic, his understanding he would not be with us longer, but his satisfaction at what he had helped to spark and all the people who had joined along with him in a movement for change. But that whole speech bears listening. And in the beginning of the speech, he sets the stage powerfully by talking about all of the renowned eras of history and, and imagines what if he had had a chance to live in any of those great times with great leaders and great changes, which would he have chosen? And he walks through history, but concludes he would have lived in that moment he was in in 1968, because it was a time ripe for change. Brothers and sisters, we are living now in that time ripe for change. And I want us, even when we turn on the television news, do not be discouraged. Even when you go online, do not be afraid. Because something deeper and bigger is going on here. It has been brewing for the last few years, but now it has all come out in the open. Remember how for years and years in this country, you could not get a conversation started about the horror of mass incarceration. But a movement over the last few years changed that. It is now on the front burner. It's in all our consciousness. And it's starting to change. And I'm very proud to say in this city, I've said it before, the era of mass incarceration did not begin in New York City, but it will end in New York City when we close Rikers Island for good. You used to not be able 
to have a full and blunt and honest conversation about the relationship between our police and our community. But that is changing all over this country. And NAN has been a crucial part of that. And I want to remind you, in this city, in this city, when we got rid of a broken policy of stop and frisk, when we created neighborhood policing, when we brought police and community together, we got safer. We got safer by being fairer. But you used to not have an honest discussion. That is happening now, and people are organizing like never before. We could not believe for a long time there could actually be change when it came to fighting for gun safety. It looked like the NRA just had everything locked down until those brave students from Parkland, Florida showed us, they showed us that change was possible, that people could be organized all over this country. Students in all 50 states. Rev, you have to go back to the time when you were a young man and people were organizing in the civil rights movement to see high school students doing something so powerful. Doesn't that augur well for all of us and for this moment of change? Women organizing like never before. The greatest protests in the history of the United States in the wake of Donald Trump's inauguration. All 50 states. Now, you see how these dots are starting to connect. How about when it comes to elections? How about the state of Alabama? There was more voter suppression there than you could possibly imagine, but people voted anyway, and they changed the world. Connect all these dots, and something amazing is happening. And by the way, God bless the teachers all over this country who are saying enough is enough, and standing up in red states and forcing a change. So I conclude with this. And I don't mean this to be an overstatement because I feel it in my heart. We're living through a time of miracles. Things are happening that were not supposed to be possible. It wasn't possible to win that Senate seat in Alabama. It wasn't possible for those teachers to get fairness. It wasn't possible for high school students to organize in all 50 states. But it all just happened, and it happened in a matter of months. Months, not years, not decades. So my friends, let's meet the moment. And there is no organization in America better poised to meet the moment than the National Action Network. Someday we will look back at this time and we will cherish the fact that we were part of these big changes. And history will show that you were the authors of the progress and the change and the better country for all. Thank you. God bless you all. Mayor Bill de Blasio. We're going to, in a moment, cut the ribbon, but we already have started a convention. Let me tell y'all, we're gonna hear speeches, then we're getting into workshops where people can participate. We're having a town hall tomorrow at four, where the whole audience is. I wanna hear from y'all on concrete ways we're gonna organize. This is not just to come and hear folk talk. I wanna hear y'all talk, I'm gonna conduct it myself. Then on uh, starting 9 o'clock every morning, you need to be here. Don't come at 10 looking for a seat, walking down the aisle like you at a fashion show. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, the media panel starts on time. Friday, Elizabeth Warren's going to speak at 9.30. Then behind her will be Kamala Harris. Then behind him, her will be Bernie Sanders. And behind him will be Cory Booker, all of them. They talk about running for president. We're going to hear them on time. But some folks is talking about a guy named Eric Holo to be running for president. I don't know. I, I'm not going to start nothing. I'm just saying what I'm hearing. I wouldn't put him on the spot with a run, Eric, run, chant. I wouldn't dare do that. I 
wouldn't dare do that. There's, there's press here. We don't want them to get the wrong story. But I want our chapter leaders, Kirsten John Foy, who's hosting it, to come forward. Let's cut the ribbon. And then I'm happy to have our chapter leaders from all over the country come. Our young, our head of our youth department, Mayor Pat Hector, you stand in the middle, 20 years old. She's been leading our youth department since. And Shane Harris, who's 25, leads San Diego. Bishop Hill leads Cincinnati. All our chapter leaders. Reverend K.W. Toulis runs our L.A. office. Reverend Cummings of Watts, California. Reverend Porter of Sacramento, California. Dr. Haynes of Oakland, California. Marcia McCoy, McCoy of Cleveland, Nan. Beverly Gordon, Utah, Alabama. Help get that black woman vote out. Cynthia Davis of Staten Island. Janique Curry, Buffalo, New York. Elijah Coles. Where is Elijah? Richmond, Virginia, 14 years old. Stephen Young, South Jersey. Reverend Shane Harris, I said. Reverend Steffi Barley. Bishop Bobby Hilton, Cincinnati. Ohio Nash Action Network. Regina McCray Hunt of St. Louis. Mother Sarah Hunt. Now that's a strong black woman. All of them. Our board members, Alicia Reese and Jennifer Jones Austin. I'm going to have our young people, Mary Pat, you can officiate in cutting the ribbon. Since uh, Mayor de Blasio said, when I was a young man, you could tell when somebody had term limits, they start talking about how old you are. <laughs> if he had another election, he'd have never said that. All right, go ahead. Give her a hand. Nan is officially open. Before I bring on former Attorney General Holder and Tom Perez, and then break into our workshops. I was raised well. We have not heard from a black woman. And I was raised and birthed by a black woman. The backbone of this organization is black women. As de Blasio said, it was black women that did the miracle in Alabama. And we have a miraculous black woman in the city of New York, the public advocate of the city. Let's hear from our public advocate, Tish James. No justice, no justice, no justice. It's an honor and a privilege to be here this morning and it was great to see our president and chief, President Barack Obama, as opposed to the hater in chief, you know who, number 45. So I wanna thank uh, Reverend Sharpton, the most influential and prolific civil rights leader in modern history, a round of applause. And of course to uh, the great Reverend Dr. Franklin Richardson, the chairman of NAN, I wanna thank him for all that he is doing and for all my colleagues in government the Honorable Eric Holder, the governor of New Jersey, Mayor de Blasio, um, my colleague from Howard University, Mayor Roz Baraka, um, yes, Ty, the Honorable Tom Perez, and of course, my district attorney from Brooklyn, Eric Gonzalez. Over the past 27 years, much because of Nan's work, we have seen the morals of our society evolve. We have seen the circles of our lives and our world grow larger and more inclusive, and we have seen chains broken. And we have seen our world move closer to understanding what we always have known, and that is there is only one standard of justice. But we also know that diversity is a fact, but inclusion is a choice. And that choice has, become, has been made clear as a result of the work of Nan under the leadership of Reverend Sharpton. And this year, in particular, we have been brought back down to our knees. 
as we relive so many of the trials and tribulations we faced 50 years ago. We remember with honor the black sanitation workers in Memphis who came together to demand equal treatment, officially tying the civil rights movement to the labor rights movement. We mourned the assassination and celebrated the life and work of our moral leader, Dr. King, who chartered the course for groundbreaking legislation like the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, fair housing laws, and who uh, again provided us with equal protections under the law and was able to get rid of Jim Crow laws all across this country. And now we see it all being dismantled. We've got work to do. When black workers still make less than white workers, we've got work to do. When black women are dying during childbirth at higher rates than white women right here in New York City, we've got work to do. When black men are being arrested for small amounts of marijuana, we've got work to do. When two black men are simply arrested for sitting at a Starbucks, we've got work to do. When our children are sent home from schools for wearing a shirt that basically says Malcolm X on the back, we've got work to do. And when a child gets lost and knocks on a door and simply asks for directions and gets faced with gunshots, we've got work to do. So true justice only comes when we get together, when we struggle together, and when we pray together, and when we join together, and we stand together, and our voices are joined together. That's when justice will come. And I know that it is not lost on any of you in this room that the, that the one reason that's gonna save our democracy is the power and the strength of black women. Where are my sisters at? sisters at? Where are my sisters at? It's the power of women that's going to save this democracy as we saved it in New Jersey, as we saved it in Alabama, and as we're going to save it across this nation. No justice. No justice. Thank you, Wakanda. Tish James. I've got two more that I'm going to bring on, Eric Holder. Let us hear from the DA of Brooklyn, New York, home of the Brooklyn Dodgers at Al Shopton. <laughs> District Attorney Eric Gonzalez. Good morning, everyone. Listen, uh, we talked about Dr. King and our great president, Barack Obama. But let's hear it again for another leader from history that will always be recognized is our president here, Al Sharpton. I want to thank uh, Dr. Franklin Richardson and the Brooklyn uh, leadership, you know, uh, Kirsten Foy, uh, Kevin McCall, and the people who support me in Brooklyn. You know, this organization and all the leadership of NAN is very important to what we need to get done in this time. We've heard from a lot of speakers, but I am optimistic as well, because for the first time in the city, we have leaders who are going to stand up to make sure our justice system is actually just and not used to subjugate us. We're going to lead the way in making sure that we take poverty out of the equation in our justice system because too many poor people are in prison because they could not have good representation and because of our Brooklyn bail system. And so we're going to work very carefully and as the district attorney of Brooklyn, I'm going to lead the way in helping to keep us safe but making sure that we have a justice system that we can believe in one that is fair and just, and most importantly, reflects the values of our various communities. Because for too long, our justice system did not protect us, but it, it hurt us. And we saw that in the generation of young men who went to prison 
across this country, but in our city, generations, my generation, from the 80s and from the 90s, who went to jail for small levels of drug possession. In Brooklyn, I'm leading the way in changing that. Because in Brooklyn, we are going to treat the drug problem in our community as a health issue. I am no longer sending people to jail for drugs. I'm sending them to rehab. And we are going to continue to work on things to make sure that people who are wrongfully convicted are set out of bed, set out of jail and back into our communities. In Brooklyn, in a very short period of time, we have freed 24 men and women who were wrongfully convicted. And there's a lot more work to be done. So I want to thank the folks of NAD and all the people who are here who are helping to support me and guide me as we continue to fight for what's right in Brooklyn, protecting our immigrant brothers and sisters from unfair policies. I'm never going to back down from that. We're going to make sure that these racist policies that are looking to deport people from minor offenses does not happen. And so in my office, first office in this state, hired immigration attorneys to help the assistant district attorneys understand what's right. And finally, we will continue to make sure that we shrink our justice system because we have too many people that come into the system on these low level offenses that don't need to be arrested, sent to central booking or to Rikers Island, but in, as opposed to being dealt with in our communities. And so in Brooklyn, we are going to send much of our work back to all of you in figuring out what we need to, in order to keep our community safe but fair. Thank you, Reverend Sharpton, for the opportunity to be here. One of the things that I want us to do as we deal with this, and we'll be breaking this down in workshops, as you hear people talk, the question of low-level marijuana arrest, the question of how we deal with stop and frisk, the question of how we deal with the census and the state election, these are the things that we need to leave here on Saturday with how we're going on the ground and changing things. That's why I wanted us to open up here in substance. When, you know, some of y'all follow my uh, Instagram messages in the morning. I talked this morning about when you are a baby, they give you a pacifier. When you grow, a pacifier don't stop you. I learned when I was a baby, you know, when I was born, I was born in Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn. And uh, Brother Holder, there was three of us born that night. There was a bourgeois kind of uppity black kid. There was a kind of middle of the road Grace Baptist Church kind of guy. And it was me. And I was born about 10 o'clock. About midnight, we all wanted some milk. So the bourgeois little kid put his little pinky up, trying to very eloquently get the nurse's attention, you know. The kind of middle of the road kid kind of like, you know, waved and tried to get the attention in a nice way, a little more animated than the bougie kid, but didn't want to disturb the maternity room because he wanted some milk too. I looked over there and seen that the bougie way didn't work, the pinky didn't work, the waving didn't work, so I started kicking, hollering, and screaming, and I've been hollering ever since. I learned in the maternity ward, all that nice stuff y'all do, just sometimes don't work. And then sometimes you make noise, they give you a pacifier. But pacifier don't give you nutrition, and don't develop your bones, you need some milk. We gonna have a milk strategy coming out of here this week. Don't pacify us teaching us about race relations. 
Give us some prosecutors for racial justice. Give us the right to vote. Give us a census that cuts our district, that doesn't undercut our representation. We are sick of pacifying politics. We want the real deal, and we're going to fight to get that. May I bring to you now a person that I feel has represented that in our history more than anyone that ever has sat in the building that he ran and the justice system that he presided over. When Attorney Michael Hardy and I went and sat in the office of the Attorney General and looked at a man who has fought his way up through the Justice Department, but never left his grounding, never forgot that he was there for a reason, not a season, not trying to do anybody any favors, but not trying to do people disfavors based on politics. We don't ask for them to put their thumb on the scale. We ask them to take their thumb off our neck. And that is what he did. If it was voter suppression, he was there. Filed a lawsuit on voter ID. If it was policing, he was there. He went to Ferguson. The parents of Michael Brown and others are coming in. He has been there as the Attorney General and showed this nation that you can uphold the law and make change at the same time. He is a man that we know represented the best. That's why they held him in the Senate in contempt because it was a contemptuous charge for them at that time. Can you imagine? that you got people now running around raiding lawyers' offices. You talk about contempt. They made the whole industry a contempt in terms of what they have done in this country. And I want you to welcome, glad to see Governor Cuomo come in. I'll let him shake everybody's hand. You running this year, right? <laughs> but ain't nobody up here in New Yorkers. You, you need to shake my hand twice, Andrew. <laughs> Who has also done... <laughs> I only get every four years, the only time I get to pick at him. <laughs> but he has also done some concrete things. But let us hear from the man who stood and who never wavered, the former Attorney General of the United States of America, the Honorable Eric H. Holden. Good to be here. Uh, thank you, Reverend Sharpton, for those, those kind words. I don't know, this run, Eric, run stuff. Uh, we we got to talk to my wife about that one, you know? But uh, I want to thank you all for, for being here. I've been at this convention uh, many times before, and it's always a privilege to join so many advocates for justice at this annual, at this annual gathering. Uh, I want to take note of all the great people who are here. Uh, the wonderful people who have, were here and who had to leave. But I want to say a special hello to my friend, uh, Charlie Rangel. Those are some broad shoulders that Barack Obama and I stood on. Very, very broad. Thank you, sir. Today we gather at a, a dark time for our nation. But as Dr. King said, it is only when it is dark that the stars can shine. You all are those stars. It is imperative for all of us committed to justice and equality to shine right now. 
Now is not the time to be complacent or to be afraid. We've dealt with a lot more than a tweet in our lives, all right? Now is the time to make real the, the second word in the name of this organization, action, action. Although our laws and procedures must be continually updated, our commitment to the cause of justice must remain constant. Now from its earliest days, our republic has been bound together by its extraordinary, though sometimes flawed, legal system and by the enduring values that define it. Now, those values of equality, opportunity, and justice under law were first codified in our founding documents, and they are put into action every day by leaders like you, those stars that Dr. King referenced, who advocate for those whom the law empowers and who the law is supposed to protect. Now, although the recent actions of this administration generally and the current Attorney General specifically have made it more difficult. Criminal justice reform is not a partisan issue. It's about providing legal professionals and law enforcement leaders with the 21st century solutions they need to address 21st century challenges. It's about shaping a system that deters and punishes crime, that keeps us safe, and ensures that those who pay their debts have a chance to become productive citizens. And most importantly, it's about answering fundamental questions about fairness and about equality that determines who we are and who we aspire to be, not only as a nation, but as a, as a people, a people resolved to move forward together and committed to implementing criminal justice policies that work for everyone in this country. Now, this is the challenge, and this is the extraordinary opportunity that brings us together this morning. And it's the same challenge that drove me to launch a targeted Justice Department review of our criminal justice system, to identify areas for improvement, and to make this system as efficient and as effective and as just, as just, as is possible. Now, I announced what we called a Smart on Crime initiative that allowed the Justice Department to, to strengthen the federal system, to increase its emphasis on proven diversion rehabilitation and reentry programs and to reduce unnecessary collateral consequences for those seeking to rejoin their communities. And among the key changes was a modification of the Justice Department's charging policies to ensure that people who commit certain low-level, nonviolent federal drug crimes would face sentences that were appropriate to their individual conduct, rather than the stringent mandatory minimum sentences which were reserved for the most serious offenders. And what did we see? We saw crime drop, we saw the federal prison population drop, and we saw the department using its resources to prosecute more people who engaged in violent and serious crime. We invested in evidence-based diversion programs like drug treatment initiatives and, and veterans courts that can serve as alternatives to incarceration in appropriate cases. And we partnered with state officials, agency leaders, and others to advance proven strategies to help formerly incarcerated people successfully rejoin their communities. You have to understand something. At some point, 95% of everybody who is incarcerated, 95% of all prisoners will be released. Rates of recidivism now remain unacceptably high. And that's why the Smart on Crime initiative was designed to drive down unnecessary barriers to economic opportunities and independence. Now, I ordered the Justice Department's law enforcement components, and I asked the State Attorneys General to reconsider policies that impose overly burdensome collateral consequences on formerly incarcerated individuals without meaningfully improving public safety. Now, this is important because we've seen that maintaining family connections, developing job skills, and fostering community engagement can reduce the likelihood of rearrest. And we know that restoring basic rights and encouraging inclusion in all aspects of society increases the likelihood of successful reintegration. We took, I think, significant steps in improving reentry policies and addressing unintended collateral consequences of certain convictions. Now, the present administration wants to take us back to the failed policies of the past. They're not being tough on crime. They are not being snuff, smart on crime. They're being dumb on crime. Formerly, 
Formerly incarcerated people continue to face significant obstacles and they now face a hostile administration intent on making law enforcement an instrument of the fear that they use to divide and to try to govern us. The formerly incarcerated are frequently deprived of opportunities that they need to rebuild their lives. And in far too many places, their single most basic right of American citizenship, the right to vote, is either abridged or it is denied. And that's what I want to talk to and focus on this morning. Now, as the Leadership Conference on Education Fund articulated very clearly in a report, and I quote, there is no rational reason to take away someone's voting rights for life just because they've committed a crime, especially after they've completed their sentence and made amends, unquote. <laughs> on the contrary, there is evidence to suggest that former prisoners whose voting rights are restored are significantly less likely to return to the criminal justice system. As the report further notes, a study conducted by a parole commission in Florida found that while the overall three-year recidivism rate stood at roughly 33 percent, the rate among those who were re-enfranchised, re-enfranchised after they'd served their time, was just a third of that. Now, unfortunately, that re-enfranchisement policy that contributed to this stunning result was inexplicably and unwisely rolled back since that study was completed. And in other states, officials have, have raised hurdles to be faced by those with past conviction, convictions and seeking to regain their access to the ballot box. And that's why I believe that today, starting here and starting now, it is time for criminal justice leaders to come together to address this issue. It is time. It is time to fundamentally reconsider laws that permanently disenfranchise people who are no longer under federal or state supervision. These restrictions are not only unnecessary and un unjust, they are also counterproductive. By perpetuating the stigma and the isolation imposed on formerly incarcerated individuals, these laws increase the likelihood that they will commit future crimes. They undermine the reentry process and they defy the principles of accountability and rehabilitation that guide our criminal justice system. And however well-intentioned current advocates of felony disenfranchisement may be, the reality is that these measures are at best profoundly outdated. At worst, these laws with their disparate impact on minority communities echo policies enacted during a deeply troubled period in America's past, a time of post-Civil War repression. And they have their roots in centuries-old conceptions of justice that are too often based on exclusion, animus, and fear. Now, the history of felony disenfranchisement dates to a time when those policies were employed not to improve public safety, but purely as punitive measures intended to stigmatize, to shame, and to shut out a person who had been found guilty of a crime. Over the course of many decades, court by court, State by state, Americans broadly rejected what was a colonial era notion that the commission of a crime should result in lifelong exclusion from society. But after Reconstruction, many southern states enacted disenfranchisement schemes to specifically target African Americans and diminish the electoral strength of newly freed populations. The resulting system of unequal enforcement and discriminatory in application of the law led to a situation that in 1890, where 90% of Southern prison population was black. And those swept up in the system too often had their rights rescinded, their dignity diminished, and the full measure of their citizenship revoked for the rest of their lives. They could not vote. In the years since, thanks to the hard work and the many sacrifices of millions throughout our history and people like you, we've outlawed legal discrimination, we've ended separate but equal, and we've confronted the evils of slavery and segregation, particularly during the last half century. We've brought about historic advances in the cause of civil rights, and we've secured critical protections like the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Yet, despite this remarkable, once unimaginable, progress, the, the vestiges and the direct effects of outdated practices remain all too real. In many states, felony disenfranchisement laws are still on the books. And the current scope of these policies is not only too significant to ignore, it is also too unjust to tolerate. 
Now, across this country, about six million Americans, about six million of our fellow citizens are prohibited from voting because of current or previous felony convictions. That's more than the individual populations of 31 United States. And although well over a century has passed since post-Reconstruction states used these measures to strip African Americans of their most fundamental rights, the impact of felony disenfranchisement on modern communities of colors remains both disproportionate and unacceptable. Throughout America, about 2.2 million black citizens, or nearly one in 13 African American adults, are barred from voting because of these laws. In three states, Florida, Kentucky, and Virginia, that ratio climbs to one in five. In Florida, it is estimated that overall 1.5 million people are prevented from voting. Now, Florida voters will have an opportunity in November to vote on a constitutional amendment that would overturn that ban. I endorse that amendment. <laughs> These individuals and many others of all races, backgrounds, and walks of life are routinely denied the chance to participate in the most fundamental and important act of self-governance. They are prevented from exercising an essential right. Now, fortunately, despite unfortunate steps backward in a few jurisdictions, and thanks to the leadership of policymakers from really from both parties and criminal justice professionals, in recent years we've begun to see a trend in the right direction. In the last 20 years, a total of 23 states, including Nebraska, Nevada, Tennessee, and Washington State, have enacted meaningful reforms. In Virginia, governors adopted a policy that began to automatically restore the voting rights of former prisoners with nonviolent felony convictions. Now, these are very positive developments, but many of these changes are incremental in nature, and we need fundamental change. They stop well short of confronting this problem head on. And although we can be encouraged by the promising indications that we have seen, a great deal of work remains to be done. Given what is at stake, the time for incrementalism is clearly over. Eleven states, eleven states continue to restrict voting rights to varying degrees even after a person has served his or her prison sentence and is no longer on probation or parole, including again the state of Florida where approximately 10 percent of the entire population is disenfranchised as a result. In Mississippi, roughly 8% of the population cannot vote because of past involvement with the criminal justice system. In Iowa, action by the governor in 2011 caused the state to move from automatic restoration of rights following the completion of a criminal sentence to an arduous process that requires direct intervention by the governor himself in every individual case. Now, it's no surprise that two years after this change of the 8,000 people who had completed their sentences during that governor's tenure, voting rights had been restored to fewer than 12. Now, that's moving backwards, not forwards. It's unwise, it is unjust, and is not in keeping with our democratic values. These laws deserve not only to be reconsidered, they must be repealed. And so, do, so today I call upon state leaders and other elected officials across the country to pass clear and consistent reforms to restore the voting rights of all who have served their terms in prison or jail, completed their parole or probation, and paid their fines. I call upon experts and legislators to stand together in overturning an unfortunate and outdated status quo. And I call upon the American people who overwhelmingly oppose felony disenfranchisement to join us in bringing about the end of misguided policies that unjustly restrict what's been called the most basic right of American citizenship. Now, I applaud those who have already shown leadership in raising awareness and helping to address this issue. The issue need not break down along partisan lines. Bipartisan support will be critical going forward because even in states where reforms are currently taking hold, we need to do even more. And we need to make sure that these positive changes are, are expanded and made permanent. Virginia's progress came through the executive power of its former governor rather than the legislature, meaning that without action by state lawmakers, these reforms can be reversed by any future executive with the stroke of a pen. 
more broadly, the inconsistent patchwork of, of laws affecting felony disenfranchisement very so widely between states and in some places between cities and counties that even those who administer the laws are sometimes unfamiliar with how to apply them. And this kind of confusion means that many who are, who are legally allowed to vote erroneously believe that their rights are restricted. And too often those who do understand their rights are wrongfully turned away. So today, today together, we need, we need to correct this injustice. As the evidence has shown, and as I pointed out in an amicus brief that I filed over 10 years ago in a case challenging Florida's disenfranchisement law, permanent exclusion from the civic community does not advance any objective of our criminal justice system. It has never been shown to prevent new crimes or to deter future misconduct. And there's absolutely no indication that those who have completed their sentences are more likely to commit electoral crimes of any type. And get this, the studies have shown are even to vote against pro-law enforcement policies. Now what is clear, and abundantly so, is that these laws sever a formerly incarcerated person's most direct link to civic participation. They cause further alienation and disillusionment between these individuals and the communities that they want to rejoin. What does a person say when you're asked, well, who did you vote for? It is counterproductive to exclude these individuals from the voting franchise once their involvement with the correction system is at an end. It is contrary to the goals that bring us all together here today. And it is not consistent with the cherished ideals that once led Supreme Court Justice William Brennan to call disenfranchisement, and I quote, the very antithesis of rehabilitation, unquote. So whenever we tell citizens who have paid their debts and rejoined their communities that they are not entitled to take part in the democratic process, we fall short of the bedrock promise of equal opportunity and equal justice that has always served as the foundation of our legal system. So it's time to renew our commitment here and now to the notion that the free exercise of our fundamental rights should never be subject to politics or geography or the lingering effects of flawed and unjust policies. After all, at, at its most basic level, this isn't just about fairness for those who are released from prison. This is about who we are as a nation. It's about confronting with clear eyes and in frank terms disparities and divisions that are unworthy of the greatest justice system the world has ever known. It's about ensuring that we hold accountable those who do wrong while preserving the values of our nation that have always felt, we've always held sacred. And it's about protecting the American people and strengthening our communities while enabling all of our citizens, no matter who they are or where they come from, to make their voices heard. Now, throughout America's long history of progress, struggle, and sacrifice, as generation after generation has come together to move our nation closer to the ideals our founders envisioned and to advance our pursuit of a more perfect union, this country has always looked to its legal system to answer questions of right and wrong, of truth and justice. Well, this morning, these questions remain before us, and the pursuit of a more perfect union goes on. Now, although I recognize, as you do, that the progress we seek will not be easy, and the reforms we need will not be held, and they will not take hold overnight, I'm proud to join, and when necessary, to lead in seeking solution to these urgent issues. I am, I am honored to count you all as colleagues in the work of forging a more just society that reflects our conviction that all, all are created equal. And despite the difficulties, the opposition, and the resistance we will undoubtedly face, as I look around this room here today, I cannot help but feel confident in where today's experts and tomorrow's leaders will take us in the months and the years to come. We can do this. Thank you all very much. Honorable Eric Holder. I didn't start at that time, Eric. Let me say, and a lot of our panelists have arrived and we're going, we're a little about a half hour behind schedule because y'all showed up a half hour late. 
But I want you to know, again, Nash Action Network is about getting stuff done. We are about achievement. And when Dr. King was in his last battle, he had a two-pronged economic philosophy. He fought for poor people, and he fought with a, 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 a division of his organization called Operation Breadbasket that I started in when I was 13, the year he died, to make corporate accountable with contracts and to get us a piece of the kind of public economy that we need and deserve. We cannot keep becoming the ones that supply public taxes and then we do not get any of the tax funded development. <laughs> Governor Andrew Cuomo and I've known each other for over 20 years. And he has been one that would always go toe to toe in a room and if you threw out a challenge, he would answer the challenge. When in the year 2000, we had over 100,000 people march in Washington about racial profiling, the first big racial profiling march. Mrs. Coretta Scott King introduced her son and I to keynote. There was only one member of Bill Clinton's cabinet that would come and speak, and that was the Secretary of HUD, Andrew Cuomo. A lot of other liberals was hiding inside, peeking through the blinds, but he came out. He, when he was elected governor, came, would raise the age, came and stood up on the issues that mattered. The family is here, and then the next panel with Ben Crump from Sacramento, California. I want them to bring this back. Stand up, Grandma. This is the grandmother of Stefan Clark, his little sister and his uncle from Sacramento. I raised them because the local prosecutor deferred to a special prosecutor. Well, in New York, any police fatality, we have a special prosecutor because the governor signed that as an executive order. So from raise the age to executive order on special prosecutor, he has matched the challenges that we've come up with. But that is what we want. We don't want people patronizing us. We don't want people talking about they down with us. We don't want people talking about they progressive and can't show us no progress. We want you to show your progress by what you do when we go home. Don't give me a pacifier. Give me a bottle with some milk. I bring you the governor of the state of New York, Andrew Cuomo. Good morning. good morning. Boy, you are a good looking group. And you give my soul strength. First, the Reverend Sharpton, I've known him more than 20 years. He didn't want to say that. When we started, we were about the same age. I just read his bio. Over the years, he's gotten younger must be divine intervention. <laughs> but I have watched Reverend Sharpton, and in many ways, he fits the theme of today perfectly, because he has kept Dr. King's legacy alive, and he has moved it into action. And it's the action we need. The Reverend is exactly right. We hear a lot of talk, a lot of promises have been made over 50 years. 
But if we have a problem, we have a problem in that we haven't actually achieved enough progress. And that's what NAN is about. And that's what we've done here in New York, partnering with NAN, with Michael Hardy and Paul Persaud and Charlie King and working with my counsel, Alfonso David. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Mr. Chairman Perez, I don't want to sound like a boastful, arrogant New Yorker. I hate playing to type, but New York is the most progressive state in the United States of America. And New York doesn't just say that. Working with NAN, first state to have a $15 minimum wage, paid family leave, only state to have a special prosecutor for police killings closed more prisons than any administration in history. More alternatives to incarceration. That's New York working with NAN. Thank you for making it possible. It's always a pleasure to be with Reverend Richardson. I go to see him the week before every election. He says, I will say a prayer for you. Don't worry. So far, every election I've done that I've won, so I'm not asking any questions, but I'm, I'll see you soon, Reverend. <laughs> Tom Perez, we're glad to have your strong hand on the tiller at this time of political crisis. Let's give the chairman a round of applause. <laughs> general Holder has been the general uh, who served during two times of combat, the Clinton years and the Obama years, and he's made America a better place to be. So it's a pleasure to be with General Holder. And to my second father and my second mother, Charlie Rangel and Hazel Dukes, I love you. Let me say this. When I was HUD secretary, as the Reverend mentioned, I had a beautiful honor. I was called by Mrs. Coretta Scott King one Martin Luther King Day, and she asked me to come down and give the MLK address in Atlanta in Dr. King's church, Ebenezer Baptist Church, from his pulpit. And uh, I worked for months on the address, and I studied Dr. King and, and his teachings. And the more I learned about him, the more impressive he was. And his eloquence and his poetry is how people remember him. But his poetry, he didn't mince words. He always got to the heart of the problem. And he wasn't talking about abstract solutions. He wasn't talking about theoretical progress. He was always talking about actual progress. Because the people he was speaking about had pain in their day-to-day -day lives. And they needed help, and they needed help now on practical issues like housing and education and employment. They needed change. They needed action. And they needed it now. Now, 50 years later, I'm sure if Dr. King were with us today, he would lament what happened in this federal administration and how extreme and conservative they are. Extreme because they won't compromise. Extreme because not only do they believe what they believe, but they want to take what they believe and impose it on you. And that's not just anti-democratic, that is anti-American, my friends. And this administration is repugnant to all the values Dr. King spoke about. It's anti-immigrant, it's anti-woman, anti-gun safety, anti-equality, anti-environment, anti-inclusion. It is anti-everything that Dr. King preached about. And I'm sure he would say to us, remember November because the time for change is here and change happens when we make change happen. But Dr. King did not mince words and I think he would also make the point that we have to understand what happened in that election. How does a nation go from President Obama to President Trump? How did we lose that election? Because there is another November coming. 
And we want to make sure what happened never happens again in this land. So I'm sure Dr. King would say, look in the mirror and understand what happened and make sure it doesn't happen again. Denial is not a life strategy. You will never solve a problem you are unwilling to recognize. And that's why we're so lucky to have Chairman Perez leading the Democratic Party. Because I don't believe Mr. Trump won the election. I believe we lost the election. I don't believe anyone ran into the voting booth saying, I can't wait to vote for Mr. Trump. Boy, I feel good about this. I think we allowed them to get to that place. And I think there are two lessons when we look back. One, the Democratic Party got disconnected from the middle class. There was a desperation that they had because in terms of real wages, the middle class has gone backwards over the past 20 years. And they're in real pain. And they're 45 and they're 50 and they're 55, but the bills are still coming in and they still have to pay college tuition and they still have to pay a mortgage. And they're afraid about their job and they're afraid about their security. And they felt that desperation. And they reached out and they touched that desperation. And they said, don't worry. I'm going to take you back to the good old days. We're going to go back to the good old days. I'm going to bring the plants and the mills back. And you're going to get your old job in the mill back. And we're going to bring those factories back to America. There's no economy that goes backwards. It was a fantasy. But when your reality is that painful, you will believe a fantasy. Reminds me of those commercials you see late at night. One pill will regrow your hair, will make your chronic lower back pain go away, will increase testosterone, will make you feel 21 years old again. One pill, 1999 for one bottle. And you get an extra five bottles if you buy the one bottle. Too good to be true. But sometimes you need to believe. And if you need to believe, you will buy that prescription. And that's what Trump offered. Because we left the void. Second lesson, I think, is what we're talking about today. The Democratic Party, government of the Democratic Party, under-delivered for our minority supporters, period. In 1967, Dr. King said the country had not yet made a single solid, determined commitment to genuine equality. He was right in 1967, and if he was in New York in 2018, he would say the same thing. We have not made a commitment to genuine equality. Dr. King's eloquence did not mask the harsh truth. They talk about the school-to-prison pipeline. Truth is, it's worse than the school-to-prison pipeline. It happens before that. Inequality starts very young. It starts in the home. And for too many, the home are the projects. And then it's school, and then it's joblessness, and then it's jail, and then it's prison. It starts in the home. It starts in the projects. Dr. King said in 1966 in the Chicago Housing Authority, we are here today because we are tired. We are tired of being seated in the flames of withering injustice. We're tired of paying more for less. We're tired of living in rat-infested slums. And in the Chicago Housing Authority's cement reservations. What a beautiful phrase, cement reservations. What we did to the Native Americans, we put them on reservations. The, the least valuable land in the middle of nowhere, and we left them there. Cement reservations. This nation's public housing projects. 
New York City Housing Authority is a cement reservation today. 600,000 people, it would be the second largest city in the state of New York. And still, many of the conditions are still slum conditions. New York City Public Housing Authority has lead paint still in the apartments. Lead paint is a poison that this nation outlawed in the 60s and the 70s, and it still exists in New York City public housing. People live with no heat, they live with mold, they live with vermin, they live with rats. The tenants had to sue to get any attention. The federal government and the President Obama began a civil rights investigation, it was so bad. If President Trump thinks he's made America great again, I say to President Trump, why don't you visit NYCHA housing and tell me what you think? But the project you live in determines the school you attend. In America today, your zip code can shape your destiny. And the truth is there are two school systems in this state and in this country. Not public and private, but one for the rich and one for the poor. And you can go to a school on the rich side of town, and they will talk to you about how they're on the internet. You go to a school on the poor side of town, they don't even have a basketball net. You go to a school on the rich side of town, and they'll show you how they have laptop computers, and the child goes home with a laptop computer, and they talk to the parents. You go to a school on the poor side of town, and the most sophisticated piece of electronic equipment is the metal detector that you walk through on the way to the classroom. That's education in America today. We have some failing schools that have been failing for 20 years, generation after generation after generation. And those are the high schools that have the highest dropout rates. It's not about the money. New York spends more on education than any state in the United States of America, and I am proud of it. It's how we distribute the money. It's like income inequality. It's not that this country is a poor country. This country is the richest country on the globe. It's how we distribute the wealth. We have 4,000 public schools in this state. Some schools, we fund $33,000 per pupil. Some schools, $11,000 per pupil. How can that be? How can that be in one state? New York City, 1,600 public schools. Some are in wealthier districts and high performing, some are in poorer districts and are low performing. Well, how much do we fund the rich schools and how much do we fund the poor schools? Truth is, nobody knows. Nobody even asks. It, it's that simple. Well, we have to now look for the truth and make sure the money is going to the people and the places that need the money. We should not be subsidizing rich schools. We should be helping the poor schools. And when you get into trouble, because you didn't get the right education and you didn't get a job, you wind up before the criminal justice system. General Holder is exactly right. You walk before the judge and there's the statue of justice, blindfolded, holding the scales of justice. Supposed to be colorblind, judging just the merits. But is that really what happens? The judge determines bail. And what bail means is, if you can pay the bail, you walk, and if you can't, you sit. And if you can afford it, and you're rich, and you pay the bail, you go home. And if you can't pay the bail, well, then you go to jail. Our jail is Rikers Island. Rikers Island is the worst jail in the state of New York. More assaults, more gangs, more suicides. Rikers Island is our Robbins Island. 2014, federal government started a civil rights un investigation on Rikers Island. What's happened in four years? Basically nothing. Everybody said, close Rikers. We have to close Rikers. We have to build smaller jails that are more manageable. You know what? 
They came back and they said, okay, we're going to close Rikers Island. Guess how long it's going to take to close Rikers and build a new jail? Ten years. Ten years. Two mayors from now, three city councils. Ten years. How can it be? We're going to build a new airport at LaGuardia. It's going to take four years. We built a new Yankee Stadium. It took one year. We're building a new Tappan Zee Bridge, largest infrastructure project in the United States. It's taking four years. When they say it's going to take 10 years, it means it's not our priority. We don't want to do it. And there's been no outrage. Editorial board said, well, you have to understand, it's complicated. You know how it would be simple? If it was their son sitting in Rikers Island, you see how fast it would get simple. The common denominator for all these issues, the projects, the failing schools, the joblessness, Rikers Island, poor minorities. That is the common denominator. It's a question of power and political power and voice. And that's why the inequality has persisted. What do you need to do? Let's make genuine equality a reality. And actions speak louder than words, especially after 50 years. For public housing, this is what I say. I recently declared it an emergency. I said, you know how when Hurricane Sandy came and hit and people were displaced and people had no heat? It was an emergency. Well, we have an emergency in public housing because people are displaced and they have no heat and the state committed $500 million and we're bringing in emergency management to make the changes and make the changes now. On schools, we're going to take all 4,000. We passed a piece of legislation that said for the first time ever, we're going to see how much we give to each school. And then my position is we take the state money and we start at the bottom and we work our way up and we never give another dollar to a rich school. We equalize the spending by giving to the poor schools. On cash bail, cash bail has got to go. It lets the rich walk and it makes the poor sit. And that has to stop. We tried to get it passed through our Republican legislature this year. They stopped it. I say we need a new legislature in November. I don't want to give anyone any ideas, but there have been states that have been sued on the cash bail system. Now, if someone were to sue our state on the cash bail system, I can tell you this, I would not defend that lawsuit. We're going to start an investigation on the bail bondsmen who extort the poor at their highest point of pain with excess collateral, with excess conditions. And we're going to do that now. I don't accept 10 years to close Rikers Island. Make believe you want to do it. Do it in real time and get those young people off that island and start treating them like the decent human beings they are, getting them services rather than selves. And on reentry, General Holder is exactly right. We spent $40,000 for a jail cell. Reentry and alternative programs are always less expensive. And we're trying to reintegrate a person into society. We're trying to find them a job. We're trying to get them re-enfranchised. We work against it as a government. In this state, when you're released from prison and you're on parole, you still don't have the right to vote. Now, how can that be? You did your time, you paid your debt, you're released, but you still don't have a right to vote. At the same time, we're saying we want you part of society, we want you to get back into the community. I proposed a piece of legislation, General Holder, this past year that said parolees should have the right to vote. The Republican Senate voted down that piece of legislation. 
which is another reason why we need a new legislature this November. But I'm unwilling to take no for an answer. I'm going to make it law by executive order, and I announce that here today. Thank you. Thank you. And my last, my last point is this. Dr. King spoke about the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. He was not saying that passively the arc bends towards justice. He was saying with active intervention, we can bend the arc towards justice. That's what he was saying. And it is about progress. One of the reasons we lost that election and our people didn't come out the way they should come out because after 50 years of talk, enough is enough. Promises only go so far for so long. And they're tired of press releases and positions and proposals. They want to see real change. And that's what government is supposed to do. Make the change. Be the change you advocate. And that's what New York is. And that's what we've done working with NAN. We've done the progressive things that everybody else has talked about, but they couldn't get done. And we said, you want hope? and you want to see the future, and you want to know what this country can be, and you're tired of the hate coming from Washington, then you look at the state of New York, the beacon of possibility that says we can do these things. We can close prisons. We can have alternatives to incarceration. We can reenfranchise people. We can reach out to the middle class. And we can be the reality that Dr. King spoke of. It's not a dream. It is a reality if we make it so. Thank you and God bless you. Governor Andrew Cuomo. I want to bring my panelists up. We got one executive order. And it's not even lunchtime yet. This is the National Action Network. And who knows, may have a presidential candidate, y'all. Stay tuned. Let us bring up our panel, and then we're going to hear from Tom Perez. As we saw in Memphis, Dr. King went to Memphis and was assassinated fighting for the garbage strikers. We're glad to have as a member of our national board and the national president of ASME, Lee Saunders, give him a hand. We are proud to have the head of the American Federation of Teachers, a gladiator, a warrior, a fighter, a sister beloved, Randy Weingart. We're glad to have the mayor of the city of Newark, who has mixed activism with redevelopment like no mayor in the country, Mayor Roz Baraka. We're proud to have our, I call our policy wonk. Her father baptized me, I started civil rights under her father. Jennifer Jones, also of the Federation of Protestant Wealth Agency. And we are proud to have my colleague, my friend, this young man, 
says what he means and means what he says. He's unafraid and he has continued to stand as a progressive way before it was fashionable and understands that it is a matter of just taking the right position. He's been the editor of Nation Magazine. He is the host of All In. He's an author. I have his books here. If y'all get his book, he'll sign it for you. I beg to hang around for a while to sign some books, but y'all got to pay for them now. I didn't tell him I was going to buy them. <laughs> From MSNBC, my brother, Chris Hayes. Our sister from Missouri, from Zion, from Ohio. I'm looking at Bishop Hill thinking. From Cincinnati, Alicia Reese. And that's what I'm asking where, they, where she is. Let me also say this. There is two major parties in this country, and they are bad and good and all. Every Democrat is not good. First time I was arrested, the Democratic mayor arrested me for sitting there. Every Republican is not bad. There has been some good Republicans. I know that Trump's giving them a bad name. But we mourn today a good Republican. Barbara Bush was a very good woman. There is no one I know with more sense of humanity and fairness and that tells the truth even if it's against their friends that I've come to know and love and wanted to be here today because she's fair, she is informative. You know, a lot of folk get, spend more time in the dressing room than on the two. Cause they posing to be chosen rather than given information. She's a straight shooter and she is one that we've come to respect and regard in our community. And that is why we try to make our deadline with the White House every day on MSNBC. My favorite Republican, Nicole Wallace of Deadline White House. Now, I'm gonna hear from Tom Perez then we're gonna hear from our panel and, and ask uh, them to make their points. But I want all of us to respect the fact that they waited while uh, our elected officials spoke. And I want you to know the fact that the gov we had two governors this morning, all of this shows the strength you have if we use it. I made them come to us and address our issues if you use it. You know, I'm supposed to be controversial, not supposed to come near us. But if you stand up, people have to respect you. I must acknowledge also, and we don't leave issue when the media leave. You know, like I said, Michael Brown's parents here. We, don't leave, we never left Ferguson. We got there first day. They left. A lot of folk came in, came to new leaders, gone. I want us to give a big hand who's never left us, never left the fight. Four years later, one of the great matrons of our movement, the mother of Eric Gardner, Gwen Carr. Stand up, Gwen. I want her to meet the grandmother of Stefan Clark. Where's grandma? They went, okay, we've already connected them. Because nobody understands grandma's pain like Gwen does. And Gwen can talk to her, Miss Diallo's here from 99. I stay in touch with the families 
Cause this is not about a sound bite to me, this is life. And we become family. Miss Diallo, Sean Bell's friends, all of them, they're our guests tonight at the dinner. There will not be a man that we do any event that we do not bring together all that we have fought for. Too many activists use victims as props. But Hazel and all of us are, are real. I was thinking, you know, uh, Lee Dunney, uh, criminal justice part. Just also remember now that you treat each other nice. I want y'all to meet each other, act nice. Because you can get in trouble in court because if you're not treated nice. Dr. Richardson was telling me about he had a member in his church. Old lady, respectable. Attorney General, she lived a good life. She was 75 years old. And she went to the grocery store, Nicole, and stole four potatoes. They took her to court. The judge was outraged, 75 years old, stole four potatoes. I'm going to make an example out of you. You're supposed to know better. I'm going to give you a year for each potato. <laughs> judge got ready to sentence her, and a man started raving his hand in the back, Yana, Yana, Yana. Says, sir, what's wrong? I need to say something, Yana. He says, well, what do you need to say? Who, who are you? He said, I'm her husband. He said, well, what do you need to say? He says, I just want you to know she stole three bags of black eyed peas, too. <laughs> so y'all better treat each other right. Chairman of the Democratic National Committee, former Labor Secretary, our brother, Tom Perez. Unfair. That's so unfair. Good morning, everyone. How do you follow that? I have no idea. Reverend Sharpton, uh, thank you for your unflagging leadership. It is such an honor to be here with you. Uh, I've come here with many different hats on. I came here as the head of the Civil Rights Division, came here as your Labor Secretary, I come here as the chair of the Democratic Party, and every single time I come here, because, you know, when your gas tank is a little low, you go to the gas station, and, and when you need to fill your moral gas tank, you come to the NAN conference, and that's why I'm here. I tell you, folks, no disrespect to Lou Gehrig, but I feel like the luckiest person on the face of the earth because I had the privilege of working for the likes of Ted Kennedy years ago. I had the privilege of working for a guy named Barack Obama. And I had the privilege of working under the leadership of a guy named Eric Holder, one of the most impactful attorneys general in American history, folks. It's really easy to work for a boss who understands that the Department of Justice means justice for all, not justice for a few. An attorney general who understands that people fought and made the ultimate sacrifice for the right to vote, and we must never forget that. He understood that it was always the right time to do the right thing. And I will tell you, we talk a lot and we appropriately commemorate the anniversary of Dr. King's assassination. But you know what, last week we celebrated we marked another anniversary, and that was the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Fair Housing Act. The Fair Housing Act would never have happened but for the likes of people like Senator Ed Brooke, the first popularly elected African American in the United States Senate, who fought as part of America's greatest generation and could not get access to housing when he came home. It would not have happened but for the leadership of Clarence Mitchell Jr. of the NAACP, who was often referred to as the 101st Senator. And you know what, folks? We almost didn't celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. Because in 2011, a case found its way to the Supreme Court. The goal of that case was to do away with the heart and soul of the Fair Housing Act. Yes, Under the leadership of Eric Holder, 
We were able to defeat that effort and we were able to celebrate the Fair Housing Act. So you read so much about what this Attorney General has done and I'm here to tell you some of the other things that may not make the history books but certainly had as much impact. He understood, Mr. Crump, that the shooting in Sacramento was not a local matter. When there's injustice everywhere, it's everybody's matter. It's everybody's business. And that is why he did more work, and I was proud to work side by side with him, to build constitutional, elect, uh, constitutional policing, effective policing. They are not mutually exclusive. They go hand in hand. Eric Holder understood that. Unfortunately, we live in a different world. And the question I ask every single day, whether it's what do we do about gun violence? What do we do about police misconduct? What do we do about fair housing? What do we do about the right to vote? What do we do about dreamers? What do we do about the right to organize? What do we do about making sure that women have the right to control their own bodies? What do we do about the fact that we have a Secretary of Education that doesn't believe in public education and an EPA administrator that doesn't understand climate science. What do we do? The answer is we vote. When they go low, we go vote. When they go low, we go vote. That's what we do, my friends. I had the privilege of spending time in Memphis last week and it wasn't the first time I was there. And I tell you, if I could ask you for one moment to give it up for my good friend Lee Saunders, the head of ASME, who organized the I Am campaign to make sure that this wasn't simply a commemoration, it was a call to action. And it was such an honor to be there because we weren't there to simply talk about what happened in the past. We were there to talk about what we must do in the future. The most important question Dr. King always asks, what can we do for others? And if there's a lesson I learn from Dr. King's legacy, it's that we must always be bold as a nation. America's at its best when we are bold, when we are inclusive, when we understand that we all succeed only when we all succeed. It's truly remarkable when you think about it. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was first introduced in 1948 by a guy named Adam Clayton Powell, congressman from Harlem. It took 16 years to pass that law. You know, he could have taken a victory lap after that 16-year odyssey. What did he do with his Nobel Prize and other things? He marched right back to the White House. And he said, we need a Voting Rights Act, Mr. President. And when Mr. President said, I'm not sure I can do that. My political bank account has been depleted. Andrew Young and Dr. King and others said, we've got to work to replenish that political bank account. And how do we do that? We organize, organize, organize. And that's exactly what they did. And so, that boldness and that inclusiveness, that's what he was all about. And that's the lesson I take. I came to you a year ago. I was two months or so into my tenure as the head of the Democratic Party. And I told you this. I said, I am sorry. I'm sorry we took you for granted. I remember going to that AME church in Detroit on a listening tour, being told correctly, you gotta stop showing up at my church every 4th October pretending that you care. She was right. We lost not only in 2016, but we lost so many elections because we stopped organizing. We lost because we took too many people for granted, including African Americans, our most loyal constituency. We lost because we squandered our technology advantage. We lost because our message of opportunity got muddled. We lost because we took too many things for granted. And I came here and I told you, never again. 
The mission of the new Democratic National Committee is to help elect Democrats from the school board to the Oval Office. And we will organize everywhere. And we will lead with our values everywhere. And I'm here to tell you that's exactly what we're doing. And I'm here to say, not simply, we've learned from our mistakes. I'm here to say thank you. Because the victory in Alabama on the... The victory in Alabama was the victory in this room, African-American women, the backbone of the Democratic Party. <laughs> Led that victory. And you know what, folks? When people said, when I told people we're, in, we're all in in Alabama, and I wasn't waiting until Roy Moore won. You know, people say, you know, did you catch a break with Roy Moore? And I'll be honest with you. Was I rooting for Roy Moore to win the primary? Heck, I was rooting for Roy Moore to win the primary. But you know what, folks? We started organizing way earlier. 100% of our investment went into African-American outreach. And you know what, folks? The folks that we hired as consultants on the ground, African-American women from Alabama who knew Alabama, African-American faith leaders from Alabama who knew Alabama. That's what we did. That's the new DNC. We're investing everywhere. We're taking no one for granted. The week before the election in Alabama, there was an election in Atlanta, Georgia. And a week before that election, we got a call from Keisha Lance Bottoms. She was four to five points behind in the polls. She was worried. We had already invested in that race, but we redoubled our investment. We invested more money. We bought 55,000 cell phone numbers. We ran from the DNC, an SMS texting program, because you know what, folks? This is where people consume their news on their gadgets. We connected with those voters, and she won by 700 or so votes. We were proud to support Keisha Lance Bottoms in Atlanta. We were proud to support Vi Lyles in Charlotte, North Carolina. We were proud to invest in Virginia, where communities of color were part of a broad coalition, what Reverend Barber would call a fusion coalition of success. That's what we're doing. We're investing everywhere. And I'm here to tell you, folks, I come to you like everybody else with unrelenting optimism. Because you know what, folks? When people ask me to describe America, I describe America in two words. Endless possibilities. Bold possibilities. This is not the first time we've hit a pothole in our nation's journey to form a more perfect union. We've seen this before, but every single time we've seen it before, we've had the Reverend Sharptons of the world out there. We've had those frontline generals. And I feel like I am simply a corporal in this movement. When I see the likes of Hazel Dukes and, and Reverend Sharpton, and I talk to Andrew Young and others, and I see General Saunders, General Weingarten, leaders of the union movement, I am in awe because you know what, folks? We are all in this together. And the most important thing we're doing in 2018 as a Democratic Party is voting. Commit to vote. That is our initiative. Our bold goal is to get 50 million more people out to vote. We can do this, folks, but we can't do it without you. In 2014, 47 million less people voted than in 2012. When less people vote, we lose. We know why that is happening in part. These pernicious voter ID laws have made it harder. There's no doubt about it. Partisan gerrymandering has created an unlevel playing field. You look in Pennsylvania, Barack Obama won that by five and a half points in 2012. There were 18 members of Congress, 18 congressional seats. The Democrats running in Pennsylvania in 2012 won over 50% of the vote. And we won five out of the 18 seats because they had so gerrymandered that state that elected officials were choosing their constituents. Constituents should choose their elected officials. 
That's what we should be doing. That's why I applaud the Attorney General's initiative on redistricting, because we have to create a level playing field. But you know what? Even in the unlevel playing field that we see now, we're winning everywhere. And we're winning everywhere when we lead with our values. That's exactly what we're doing in the Democratic Party. I'm so proud of the fact that we have helped flip over 40 seats in every zip code across this country. We are working hard. We're winning elections in Oklahoma. Why? Because we're talking about the issues that matter most. In Oklahoma and Kansas, tens of thousands of school children are going to school four days a week because Republican leadership has cut funding to the bone. I was your labor secretary. We had a lot of discussions about the future of work. I never had someone come in and say, Tom, I've got a great idea about how to build a 21st century economy. Let's have our youngsters go to school four days a week. That is a morally bankrupt strategy. It is an economically bankrupt strategy. And I applaud the leadership of Randy Weingarten and other teachers who are standing up and saying, we need a secretary of education who believes in public education. We need to invest in our teachers. We need to invest in our computers. We need to invest in our future. That's what we're doing. That's why we won four seats in state legislative races in Oklahoma in districts that Trump won by more than 20 points. Folks, we can win everywhere when we lead with our values. We can win everywhere when we organize. We can win everywhere when we marshal the power of we, that collective power of we. And that's what we're all about. And I wanna make sure that you know what we're fighting for every single day. The Democratic Party is fighting for a better future for everyone. We're fighting for a worker's right to organize. We are fighting for an education system that works for everyone. We're fighting to make sure that we build more schools and less prisons. We're fighting to make sure we pass that ballot initiative in Florida that gives former offenders the right to vote. Because when you've paid your debt to society, you should be able to participate in society. We're fighting to make sure that zip code is never determinative of your destiny. We're fighting to make sure that dreamers can dream. And Reverend Sharpton, one of the things I'm so grateful for you is that you understand that the mission is broad. You are out there for dreamers. You are out there for the family of the, of, of, of the Clarks or the families of Ferguson, the families of the Diallos. We work together on Sean Bell. You're out there for justice in every zip code, not just here in the New York area. And that is what we're doing at the Democratic Party. We're fighting to ensure that everybody gets counted in the census. You know why they're trying to do it differently because they want to make sure they can disenfranchise you. We're fighting to make sure that every eligible person can vote. We're making it easier for people to vote, not harder for people to vote. That's what we're doing, folks. We're fighting, in short, for dignity and decency and inclusion. It's what brought my family here. They came from the Dominican Republic. They settled in Washington Heights, 152nd in Riverside. I drive. New York City was that beacon of hope, that beacon of opportunity. The Democratic Party was the party of freedom fighters. That's what my parents taught me. They taught me the Democratic Party always had your back on the things that mattered most. They taught me the Democratic Party is the party of we. And we see that in the work we're doing for shared prosperity for everyone. We're not the party for me. We're the party for everyone. And so we need to work. I leave you with one word, 202. Folks, there are 202 days till November the 6th. 202 days till the weekend. Every single day between now and November the 6th. You need to ask the question that Dr. King asked of us. What are you doing for others? That's what we're asking. That's what we're doing. And the answer for me is we are making sure that everyone votes. I will vote is our signature initiative. When we vote, when we organize the vote, when we protect the vote, when we get out the vote, we win. 
That's how we're going to make history because history has its eyes on us. And that arc of the moral universe is indeed going to bend back to justice. But it'll never bend on its own. So let's keep bending it together. Thank you for fueling my spiritual tank. Let's do it together. Tom Perez. Now let me say, as we start, shh, 